Hello, so today I want to talk about a concept that is used in radiation protection by health physicists that is known as the specific gamma ray constant. This is used a lot by people to figure out radiation exposure from a distance based off of a certain activity of an isotope. Um, there's a lot of little nuances in it that I don't think are always fully fleshed out and since it's a derived unit um, sometimes it's confusing on how to use it it's a it's a uh, it's not just a single unit there's multiple units in the specific gamma ray constant and it's kind of just a, I guess, a, a juggle of how to get from one point to another using it. So I'm, I want to go over how exactly we use this unit, how you can derive it yourself. Um, different sources, usually this unit is kind of looked up in a reference source. Sometimes different reference sources have different numbers for the same unit. Um, hopefully you'll kind of understand a little bit why after I'm done here. Um, and where it, where it all comes from and how to appropriately use it as well as its limitations. So I just want to start off with the definition here. Uh, the gamma radiation exposure rate from a point source of unit activity at unit distance. And this is known as the specific gamma constant. I guess a gamma ray constant. Gamma ray constant. So a couple things just inherent in the definition here to understand is that first off we're talking about just gamma radiation. We're just talking about, you could really say photon radiation, gammas, x-rays, whatever photon radiation that would contribute to that exposure rate. And there's some limitations inherent in that because most isotopes emit a wide array of gamma energy as well as x-ray energy and depending upon the abundance of that gamma ray or x-ray energy and the air attenuation qualities and tissue attenuation qualities because sometimes this is also used for dose equivalent uh, estimations that some of that gamma radiation or x-ray radiation may not play a big role in the, the final constant number. So just keep that in mind. Um, also, if we're talking about exposure rate, and I'm going to give an example of calculating this for exposure rate. And what I mean by exposure rate is either the scientific unit, I know these units are supposed to be phased out, but they're still used very commonly, or the classical Rankine unit. So an exposure rate unit is defined as just coulombs per kilogram, charge per kilogram, where the old Rankine unit, um, the strict definition of it was one stat coulomb generated within uh, 0.001293 grams of air. But we'll just go in relation to the Rankine to the X unit, which is 2.58 times 10 to the negative 4 coulombs per kilogram. And that is what we're going to use when we derive this specific gamma ray constant. The second thing to keep in mind is that this is dealing with the point source. So point source, generally speaking, 
we have a small source of radiation and everything that is emitted from that radiation, all the corpuscular photons are done in a spherical manner. I can't really draw a sphere very well. My artistry is not good, but imagine this is all in a spherical mat manner. Imagine also that the photons that are emitting out of here are emitting at a constant rate. So whatever that is, just arbitrarily, you know, 500 photons per second. And because of that, they're uniformly distributed around this spherical shape. So whatever that is, whatever 500 per second, that being the source strength, you know, we could call that S1 the source strength, that would be divided by the surface area for a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. And this is going to play a big role in determining that gamma ray constant as well. So imagine that we've got a spherical shape. All of these photons that are being emitted out of there are uniformly around that sphere. So essentially we end up getting, if you were to take a cross section of that sphere, the amount of photons within that cross section, you know, say it's in centimeters, are going to be the same depending on the distance away from it. And the further away you get from it, the less photons you're going to have per centimeter squared. Or the closer you get, the more photons you're going to have in that cross section per centimeter squared. Because as you make that sphere wider, you have more surface area, you have still have the same amount of photons, so you're going to have less photons per unit surface area. The, the next thing to understand is we're talking about unit activity at unit distance. So the units for this specific gamma ray constant, the symbol that's usually u is used is the Greek letter uh, capital gamma. The units, since we're dealing with exposure, we're going to stick with Rankins. You'll see for these are typically Rankin per hour meters squared per curie. This confuses people sometimes, and they put it in here for convenience sake because this unit is often paired up with what we call the inverse square law. And I'm gonna I'll explain that as well after we de derive it. Why it's convenient to keep this in here, and also when we're using the ga specific gamma ray constant, why it's convenient, and also how this relates to the inverse square law. So, unit activity, when we say unit activity, we just mean Curie's is one Curie. Okay, and it could be Becquerel's, it could be Curie's, it could be Mega Becquerel's. As long as you convert your units accordingly, it doesn't really matter what activity unit you use. Same as it doesn't really matter what um, if you want to use X or you want to use Rankin or if you want to use Gray or Sieverts just as long as your units all cancel out and you'll see that this whole thing is just a juggle of cross canceling units also at unit distance so what we mean with that is that it's going to be a meter squared it means that this unit is a meter away from the point source so we have our point source here. Whatever that exposure rate is, it's one meter away. And this is where that exposure is being measured at. Okay. All right, so let's, let's start how we do this. So first off, um, I'm going to use cobalt 60. Let's get this out of the way. I'm going to use cobalt 60 as my test, I guess. That's what we're going to derive. The reason I'm going to do it is because we have cobalt 60 has 
two very common and easy to work with gamma energies. The first gamma energy that we're going to use is 1.17. The second gamma energy we're going to use is 1.33 and these are both mega electron volts. Also, the abundance of both of these is pretty darn close to 1. So the fraction of them is both going to be 1. And what I mean by that is for every transformation, for every, we get one photon or gamma. And I'm just going to use T for transformation. transformation okay all right so let's set this thing up first we're gonna just use X exposure rate as the unit the first thing that we want to throw in there is the fraction which I described as photons per transformation. The second thing I want to throw in there is the energy, so E, which is going to be MeV per photon. The next thing that I want to throw in here because at this point we would have MEVs per transformation. The next thing I want to turn in here, uh, throw into this equation, is because I want to get from energy to ion pairs because, uh, or to charge, because the definition of Rankine is charge per mass. So we use what's called the W factor for that and the W factor and it's usually a defined factor the International Council on Radiation Units Protection Units and Measurement defines this and we're going to use um, ion pair and we're going to use the definition of 33 Point 0.8 electron volts per iron pair. So that basically means that for every photon that's coming out, in order to make an ion pair, and this is defined for air, it's got to expand 33.8 electron volts. And then since we're down in electron volts here and mega electron volts here, let's throw in a conversion, 1 times 10 to the 6 electron volts per mega electron volt. Okay, so they, that way those will all cancel out and we're going to be left with ion pairs per transformation. I don't really want ion pairs per transformation, but I would like to have coulombs per curie. So let's, first let's go with the activity. And what I'll do is I'll do transformations per second per curie. So the definition of a curie, 3.7 times 10 to the 10 transformations per second per curie. So now I have a time unit also that I've thrown in. So it's got a rate to it now. And the activity in curies. I want to turn this time unit into hours. So, 3.6 times 10 to the 3 seconds per hour. That makes that an hour. So that gets rid of the seconds, turns seconds into hours. And we have, um, basically, now we will end up with ion pairs per curie per hour. 
ion pairs. So when you think of an ion pair, um, an atom was ionized, right? The definition of Rankine, we only sum up, you know, the charges of one sign. So when you have that atom, here's my atom, you eject that electron. So you got the negative electron, the positive. Each one of these has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. You know, these are negative charges, these are positive charge. The charge is the same for on the atom, remaining atom, as it is for the electron. We're just adding up all the charges of one sign. So each ion pair is going to have 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs per ion pair. Okay, that's how much charge is released per ion pair. So we in, we're going to end up now with coulombs per curie per hour. Another thing that we have to introduce now is what's called the mass attenuation coefficient. And I'm going to actually use a new sheet to go over this. I'll bring it back to there in a minute. But the mass attenuation coefficient, or I'm sorry, the mass absorption coefficient is usually written as mu en subscript en over rho. We use this subscript en to distinguish the mass absorption coefficient from another one that's used called the mass attenuation coefficient. This one here is typically used in shielding. This one here is typically used in dose calculations. The difference between these, if you imagine we've got a source, we've got photons coming off of that source. If we have a point right here where we're measuring mass absorption, this mass absorption takes into account the probability of these photons actually interacting in that mass and how much of the energy is deposited in that mass. So on the other side of this, you have, within here you have this photon interacted and it also deposited a certain amount of energy. Some of that energy may have escaped, so it doesn't get counted. Where this coefficient, you assume that as these photons are coming through here, and it interacts, it's the probability of interaction it's basically just that, the probability of interaction and that entire photon is just removed. Okay, So that's why it's typically used in shielding because if you have some shielding here this photon comes, it's completely removed. On the other side of that you only have, say in this case, these two remaining photons that get through, they didn't interact, so they make it through they're still counted in the measurement, but this one is not. Because it was completely completely moved out of the equation. And if you studied this stuff before, you know that this is 2 for good geometry. And the gamma constant is the same way. So what I mean by that is if you have a stream of photons and you're measuring what's the exposure rate from those photons, you're only counting the primary photons coming off of the source. You're not counting for any, you know, scatter. A photon might have came up this way and scattered back down into the detector, or it might have went this way, scattered back down into it. Same way with shielding. When you have shielding, you're going to have some scatter that might happen, but we're not counting any of the scatter. We're only counting in the in these equations, and the the final result of these equations is only counting the primary photons and what happens to them. Either the primary photon interacts and deposits some energy, in the case of the mass absorption coefficient, 
or the primary photon interacts and is completely removed out of the equation, as in um, the mass. Uh, I'm sorry, I call this one the mass attenuation coefficient, the mass absorption coefficient, or they the removed as in the mass attenuation coefficient. And the mass attenuation coefficient is generally used as an exponent, kind of like in an equation like this. And I will go over in depth for that right now. But that's generally how this one is used, because we're talking about attenuation. And attenuation is not really a linear function. It's a logarithmic function. OK, so how do we figure what this is out? Um, once again, there's published tables for them, but it's kind of an extra step if you want to be extremely accurate. Cobalt-60 is kind of nice in a sense that most references, because we have a 1.17 and we have a 1.33 MeV, a lot of references will lump those together and they'll just call it 1.25 MeV. So when you refer to the gamma, you can just use it 1.15 when you're trying to figure out the gamma constant. And also when you're figuring out um, what this mass absorption coefficient is, they'll usually have a column in there that's right at 1.25. And if you didn't know that, it might seem kind of odd because the scales are usually like 1 MeV, 2 MeV, 3 MeV, so on and so forth, but out of nowhere they'll throw in this 1.25 and this is generally why, because they're trying to give you a nice little shortcut for cobalt 60. So anyways, we're not going to do that. We're going to go one photon at a time. Um, so in, like I said, in this table it's not going to have an entry for 1.17 MeV. It's going to have an entry for um, 1 MeV and it's going to have it actually it's going to have that entry for 1.25 so we can use that this table that I'm going to use it comes from the NIST website uh, National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology and you have to do an interpolation a linear interpolation uh, linear interpolations are derived from the fact that we're assuming that, especially when the curve, you know, you've got a table kind of like this, and on the bottom of it you'll have whatever the energy is, um, typically an MeV, and then, then on the side you'll have this mass attenuation, co uh, mass absorption coefficient, Units of these are always in centimeters squared per gram. What this unit comes from is this row down here is density, right? So the row is density in grams per centimeter squared, or cubed, sorry. This is always going to be per uh, unit length. So UEN by itself is going to be 1 over centimeters. So you put one over centimeter, we're looking really weird here, over grams per centimeter cubed flip this up and you just end up getting centimeters squared per gram and that's what that unit is that's why this up here was had, I had the row here to cancel out the row so this ends up being just uh, per centimeter unit so anyways so on this side you'll have that you'll have the centimeters squared per gram and you'll typically have a curve that looks something like you'll sometimes you'll have a little spike for like the K edge and it'll look like something like this well the idea is that when you get two spots really close together when you get two spots really close together you can do a, 
you can do a linear interpolation of them because the line gets pretty straight you know when you get close together and what you're trying to figure out is using slope equations because the slope like I said the slope gets pretty straight when you get really close you just use a linear slope um, equation so M for a linear slope, M stands for the slope, and we'll have x2 minus x1, which would be the x-axis, over y2 minus y1, the y-axis. So that's M1, and M1 at a different point would be x3 over x2 and y3 over y2 so m's are the same so you can algebraically solve this And we're trying to solve for, in this case, this being y, we're trying to solve for y2. Right? That's the one that we don't know what it is. Okay? So, what you end up doing, solving this algebraically, and I'll just try to run through this real quick you would end up with x2 minus x1 times y3 minus y2 Actually, let's change these twos to ones. Sorry. Because you don't know what y2 is. y2 is a variable, and I don't want to have two different y2 variables. And it would be the same. We're just changing the two different points. Make sure we change the x's to one as well. So that x1, y1 is one point. x3, y3 is one point. So so visually so you can see what kind of we're doing here is let's imagine that this point right here is my x3 y3 point and then this point in the middle is my x2 y2 point and this point right here is my x1 y1 point Okay, and we're just trying to figure out, assuming that this slope, you know, and it wouldn't be this wide, it would be smaller than that, but assuming this slope between these three points is pretty much a straight line, we're trying to figure out what would be the y2 value for this point right here. Okay, so given that, back to solving this, we brought that around. And then on this side, we would do the same thing is equal to x3 minus x1, y2 minus y1. Bring this down so you would have x3 minus x1. Brought that down. And then on this side, we want to leave y2 on this side. So minus y1 on this side plus y1 on this side. Okay? So you would end up writing this out a little bit neater down here. y2 would be equal to y1 plus x2 minus x1 y2 
3 minus y1 all over x3 minus x1. And that's your linear, sorry, interpolation equation. And if you want to make it more user friendly, which is what I try to do, your x's, right, are actually energies. So what you can do, and your y is rho. So if you want to keep that, that's a little complicated to write, but you can write E for energy on these to make it a little bit more user friendly. So knowing that you can put, you know, E here is actually 2 is the gamma that you're trying to find. And then E1 or the gamma that you're working with. And then E3 minus E1. So in the table, what you would do is you'd look up, you'd look up your energy and what the mass absorption coefficient is corresponding to that energy. So for energy 1, in this case, we're dealing with 1 MeV. Let's start out on another page. And you can make a little table to kind of make this easier. So on energy 1 in the table, E1 is equal to 1. E2, or your E gamma that you're working with, we're going to work with 1.17, and all these are in MeV. And your E3 is going to be 1.25. So your y1 that corresponds with this is looked up straight in the table on the NIST table. And let's see, one second. So on your NIST table, make sure that you're looking up your mass absorption coefficient and not the attenuation coefficient. But what it what it is for one MeV gamma in air, also remember this is for an air, dry air. And then your y2, that's what you're trying to find. Your y3 for 1.25 is 0 0.02666 squared per gram. Throw the units in there. Centimeter squared per gram. So bringing this back to our equation, y2 is equal to 1.17 minus 1 times 0 0.02666 over 1.25 minus 1 plus zero point zero two seven eight nine 
and we'll kind of crunch that out here real quick. Seven minus one times. Sorry, what did I do here? Sorry. Zero, two, seven, eight, nine. Point zero two six 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 minus point zero two seven eight nine divided by one point two five minus one and then we add point zero two seven eight nine and then, then we get zero point zero two seven zero five so you'll see that there's a slight difference than this one here point zero two seven eight nine because this was the lower energy we get a little bit higher energy the probability of interaction gets a little bit less so centimeters squared per gram and that would be our mass absorption coefficient for that 1.17 gamma photon that's coming out of cobalt 60. So let's throw this constant back into our equation over here or this mass absorption coefficient which is a constant two seven zero five centimeters squared per gram I'm starting to run out of space over here So next that we see, we're also we're not really in the units that we want with this as well. We're in grams and centimeters squared, but we'd rather be in kilograms and in uh, meters. So in the sake of kind of running out of space, let's solve what we have here so far and cross cancel out what we have so far. So at this point, our fraction, it's going to be 1 because we're just, the fraction for the abundance for this 1.17 MeV is very, very, very close to 1 for cobalt 60. The energy that we're dealing with in MeV is 1.17. These are all good. And so we're going to start. I can cancel out some of the units here. Photons, photons going to cancel out. Transformation is going to cancel out over here. MeV is going to cancel out over here. Electron volts. <clears throat> Ion pair. Seconds. Alright, so let's crunch all those real quick. So we'll have 1 times 1.17 divided by 33.8 times 1 e to the 6 times 3.7 e to the 10 times 3.6 e to the 3 times 1.6 e to the negative 19 coulombs per ion pair times 0 0.02705 and 
then essentially we end up with 2 times 10 to the negative 2 and double checking what we have for units here we have coulombs centimeters squared for gram well, let's go with hour per hour per curie per gram okay from there I want to get to kilograms <clears throat> so 1,000 kilograms I'm oh, sorry 1,000 grams per kilogram either forgot the eye for the curies. I want to get to meters so one meter squared per hundred centimeters and this whole thing gets squared and then I want to convert because I'll end up with coulombs per kilogram I want to convert that to Rankin so one Rankin is 2.58 times 10 to the negative 4 coulombs per kilogram. So the coulombs, for the grams will cancel out, the kilograms will cancel out, the coulombs will cancel out, the centimeters will cancel out. And we'll end up with Rankin meter squared uh, per hour per curie. But we're not done with, even though that's the right units that we want, we're not done because that doesn't take into effect, into account um, the actual spherical nature of this. So there's one more step that we got to do, and actually all that is, is dividing this whole thing by the surface area of a sphere. 4 pi r squared and in this case we want our r to be 1 meter away so that r is just 1 meter alright so let's crunch these right here so times 1000 divided by 100 squared divided by 2.58e to the negative 4 divided by 4 divided by pi so we end up with as you can see, we end up with 0.6155. And my units here will be, this one would have been meters squared, because R is in meters. But that gets cancelled out by this metered squared here. Centimeters, centimeters get cancelled out. Coulombs, coulombs. Hour stays, Rankin stays. So we're to what we want now, correctly. Rankin per hour per curie. And that's just for that one gamma. So what you'd need to do from here is do the same thing for the 1.33 MeV. The only difference being in this case will be the actual energy which goes here and also the mass absorption coefficient will be a little bit different that goes here. The fraction will be the same because both of these are emitted at the same time with an abundance of one. So in the sake of time I'm just going to run through doing the mass absorption coefficient real quick for that second gamma. So y2 is what we're looking for. 
In this case, we're going to have our E2 is 1.33 minus 1.25 and then our second I have to look these numbers up our 1. Point Our E3 is going to be 1.5, so the mass attenuation coefficient for that is 0 0.02547, and that's going to subtract from the other one, which is 0. 02666 and we're going to divide that by our E3 which is 1.5 minus 1.25 plus our M1 which was 0. 0. sorry our mass absorption coefficient 1 2666 number crunch that really quick 0.33 minus 1.25 times 0 0.02547 minus 0 0.02 divided by 1.5 minus 1.25 plus 0 0.02 and we end up with our mass attenuation coefficient of the mass absorption, I keep saying that wrong, mass absorption coefficient of 0 0.026 Eight. I'll try to take this, keep the same number of significant digits with those. Similar squared per gram. Not a whole lot different, but it is a little bit different. So in our setup, I'll try not to write this whole thing out again, but I'll say 0 0.02 all right. So for X2, exposure to one, the fraction photon for transformation is one times 1.33 MeVs per photon divided by 33.8, the I amperes per EV times one E to the sixth times 3.7 e to the 10 transformations per curie times the seconds to hour conversion 3.6 e to 3 times the coulombs per ion pair 1.6 e to the negative 19 oh, I have a feeling I did that times 1.6 e to the negative 19 Okay, then times our new mass absorption coefficient, 0 0.02628. Okay, so our new one we end up with almost the same, 2.2 .2 times 10 to the negative 2. And then the same units would apply, We'd have at this point we have coulombs centimeter squared per hour per curie per gram 
And then we want to do the same thing, convert the grams to kilograms. Convert the centimeters to meters. Convert the coulombs per kilogram to Rankins. And then divide that whole thing by our surface area of a sphere. 4 pi, 1 meter squared. Okay, so crunching all those numbers, we get 1,000 divided by 100 squared divided by 2.58 e to the negative 4. Divide that by 4. Divide that by pi. I know I'm leaving out the r squared, but it's just 1, so divide by 1 and be 1. Same thing. So that we end up with 0 0.679. Don't want to throw any more in there. We could just do 0 0.68. How about that? 0 0.68. Those numbers are high enough that we can round that way. Rankins per hour per curie. And then you would just add these two together. So 0 0.68 plus 0 0.6155. And your total would be total gamma constant would be 1.2. Two nine six per hour per curie. Okay, which if you look at Dr. Tom Johnson's book, it's pretty much exactly that. Here, I'll actually let me show you. Here we have cobalt 60, and here is the gamma constant for it, 1.29. Now where, there's that pesky little meter squared that throws people off sometimes. Um, so because this is a derived constant, right, it's a physical constant that they've that physicists basically kind of, you know, made this unit up so we could use it easily in operations. But just looking at the unit by itself like that, when we've kind of canceled out a lot of the subcomponents of it that we've used, you you if you don't have that background knowledge, you're going to lose something. Because what you need to know inherent in this number is this is the exposure rate per hour, the Rankins per hour per curie, at a meter away from the source. Okay. A direct meter, right? Online with it. So whatever this is, and it's it, the surface area too, right? Because the surface area of the sphere, um, the units are squared, you know, centimeter squared. So however many, four pi, you know, meter squared or whatever meter squared. So we're basically talking about, you know, a square box or a rectangle or whatever at this point right here. And that's what the exposure rate is in this, if we were to measure it. No scatter, not talking about scatter, we're talking about straight up this, one meter away. 
any other distance within there, this it's not going to be this. So a lot of times it's kind of written like this as well at one meter. But what you can do to make this a functional unit mathematically, throw that meter squared in there, just take it times one meter squared because it's at one meter squared, right? times one meter squared. And then you got those units. And what this lets us do because of our knowledge of how the inverse square law works with the point source, now if we have a distance sets at any other distance from this, we just divide it by that distance metered squared. So for instance, if we want to figure out what it is half a meter away right here, we just divide it by 0.5 metered squared, boom, boom, and we get this what it is half a meter away. And that's why they kind of throw that in there, that way. And also, the way we use this in um, the inverse square, well, let me show you exactly how that works real quick. So let's start out with our gamma constant, what we know of it, right? So our gamma constant for our gamma constant for the cobalt 60 is 1.29 we'll just stick with 1.29 Franken's per hour per Curie, right? Let's just stay pure like this. What do we know about this unit? So basically we know that we had a source. If we had a source, it was a Curie source. And everything about that source in our equation is the same when it, in regards to what the exposure rate would be. We'll throw this in there so we don't get confused. Everything in that source was the same except for the distance from that source. This only holds true at well, one curie. It's always going to be a unit curie. It only holds true at one meter away. So sometimes what everything is referred to on the numerator side of the equation is the source strength. So S1, that is the source strength. That is the source and the emissions and everything that comes off of it, except for, you know, the geometrical uh, shape that those photons give off. So let's add that to the bottom, 4 pi r, let's give it a number 2, r1 squared. That's this equation and just putting in an S to all those values that were in the numerator. If we want to know the exposure rate, what this number is at a different distance, the only thing that changes is the R, right? So the S1 remains the same. And then the 4 pi. R, the R changes. So we got R2 here. 
this is going to give me an exposure rate of you know x x1 let's say that's going to give me that exposure rate this is going to give me an exposure rate of x2 on these two sides the s1 and the s1 are the same the 4 pi and the 4 pi are the same all right those are both equal constants this is different this is different this is different and this is different so we end up if we bring this up to the top we'll have s1 4 pi equals x1 r1 squared and then over here same thing s1 4 pi equals x2 r2 squared so now this and this are equal to each other because they're equal to this which is equal to which is the same and that's basically where the nature of our inverse square law comes from so x1 r1 squared now equal to x2 r2 squared and depending on what you want to know if you know what x1 is already let's say in this case it was 1.29 and we know that this was one meter away and whatever you want your r to be like in the earlier example we had a 0.5 squared now we just divide it by 0.5 squared and we get this that's why they try to make this thing convenient because if you know this all you ever have to do is just divide by the distance you know squared by the distance squared make sure you score the whole thing not sure that actually been like that. Make sure you score the whole thing, but that's it. And you could, in a sense, when you do this, when if you're trying to, I guess, make more sense of that unit other than just throwing it in there, and they do that with a lot of stuff, like when they do unity equations there's other examples as well where they throw the the unity number in there so it makes it a good conversion factor that makes sense um, certainly in this case you could probably uh, omit this piece and then that would leave that hundred squared in there in the top but you're not really divided by 4 pi r squared, so it kind of loses the whole intent of why this geometry works. Um, but that's a way. Or just when it's over with, you just you know this you know this unit is kind of buried in this. It was used when it was created. So by taking it times one meter squared. Um, is fine because one meter is what this is at. If you tried to do it with a different unit, it wouldn't work unless you used a different unit in the initial uh, derivation of this constant. But then it wouldn't be 1.29. So there is there is background knowledge required. Like you can't just it's if you don't have background knowledge of it, it is easy to misuse this. And same way with inverse square law. Inverse square law is not, as long as you've got the numbers and the units all together, it's fine. Um, okay, and that's, hopefully that clarifies things. I know it's a lot of, a lot of units and a lot of numbers coming together, but that's essentially where it comes from. More complex isotopes with a lot more gamma energies get a lot more complicated. Um, a rule of thumb that I've heard of before is 
if anything has an abundance of at least 1% or greater they usually throw it in there um, I've done these calculations on several isotopes myself sometimes they match up with reference data sometimes not so much um, I'm not sure exactly whatever that's all about sometimes it might just be due to rounding sometimes I think some of those very very low energy ones are kind of left out just because of air attenuation but um, the mass absorption coefficient should kind of compensate for that uh, but hopefully you got something out of this and thanks for watching goodbye